Lord, I shall give these laws unto thy people. Hear me. Oh, hear me. All pay heed. The Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you these 15. Oi. Ten. Ten commandments. <laughs> God has set before you this day his laws of life. <laughs> yeah, how about that? Let's give it up for our production team. Way to go, way to go. Hilarious. Hey, and big thanks to Logan Walter. Don't you love Logan? Uh, so grateful for him. Megan. Kevin and the crew, all the crew up here, they do such a great job, and we're so thankful, uh, even when our crew, Carrie or some others aren't here, that we have folks who just lead us, point us to Jesus, and uh, Logan is just uh, such a great leader and a, from a great church down there. Many of you know Austin Stone, some of you UT people may have gone there, uh, but a great, great church, and I'm so glad that he's here today. It's great to be with y'all today. Uh, hey, you can go ahead and turn in your Bible to Exodus 20, as we've been celebrating the grace of God. There's a there's, a, there's an intentionality here as we celebrate it, it braided his, his rescue. Uh, and then now we're going to talk about how to, how to live for him. So you can turn there, Exodus 20. We'll get there ultimately. You may have heard the story of the ship that was at sea. And um, the captain saw some lights that were ever closer uh, to the ship. And so he sent a, his signalman to send a message. He said, hey, tell him, turn, turn 10 degrees to the north and, and we'll be okay. So he, they sent the message. Came back to him and said, hey, um... Uh, no, you guys send, you know, you guys move 10 degrees to the south. And uh, he's, he's a little irate. And uh, he said, hey, uh, no, you guys go 10 degrees to the north. This is the captain. And then immediately a message came back and said, this is uh, third class, you know, seaman uh, John or Jones or, or something. You know, he says, he says, you need to turn 10 degrees to the, to the, to the south. And he says, no, no, no. Uh, send him a message. Uh, this we are a battleship, right? And the message came back and said, um, "No, you adjust your course. I am a lighthouse, right?" Um, maybe you've heard that story, but sometimes in life you come upon an immovable object. Sometimes in life you're confronted with something, and and here's the thing: in the, in the fog, in the night, uh, when we don't exactly see what's happening, it's not real clear. Maybe in the smoke of this cultural moment with so many voices that are coming at you. And I mean, if you're watching the news, if you're online, if you're you know, checking out social media, whatever else, you're getting a lot of voices. And it's worth recognizing you're getting many voices that are telling you how to adjust your life, which way you ought to go. But out of the smoke, out of the fog, out of the darkness comes a single voice that speaks and when it speaks, it sounds absurd, even, with all the other voices that are coming our way. It seems ancient and distant at times, but it is true. And when you, when you step into the fog, and if you're willing to listen, even step through your doubts that might be your fog, or, or your, your, the challenges of your day, or, or your, your past experiences, when you step into that, you're going to realize that the light that's coming to you is the light house. It's an immovable truth. It is the light of the world. It is Jesus who is the truth. And so throughout this summer, we're going to be looking at the Ten Commandments. Now, immediately, some of us think, man, Ten Commandments. I mean, that was a long time ago, right? We're, I mean, we're kind of sophisticated, modern culture now. In fact, there was a, there was a study done that uh, it was in Great Britain, but I, I'm afraid we're not too far behind. They, they asked the people uh, recently, in, in a survey, a study, uh, a research study, they, they said, are the Ten Commandments still relevant? Now, here's what's interesting. If you know anything about the Ten Commandments, you know that the first four have to do with our relationship with God. You could say the vertical relationship we have with God. The latter six are our relationships with each other, right? And, and, and what's interesting is they, they did the research in such a way they could rate different, uh, different commands, commandments. So certain ones were higher than the others. And so what happened was the latter six ranked much higher than the first four. Uh, think about it. Um, thou shalt not murder. Is that, is that still relevant? You know, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's a good one. We'll rank that high. Uh, don't steal from people. 
Still relevant. That's good. Uh, don't commit adultery. That'd be a good thing. Let's, let's go with that one, you know. Um, and it went on down the line. Missing the point altogether that I want you to hear. Because behind every commandment here, we're going to think, think about this today and throughout the summer, is a God who loves us, who, who, who is longing for, no, has already established the possibility of a relationship with us. And you can't, I'd say it this way, you cannot follow the Ten Commandments if you do not follow the God who gave them to us. And this is why today we're going to ultimately get to the first commandment. I'd say it this way. If you don't follow the first commandment, you disobey every one of the others. And this is Jesus' point. When you look in the New, Te- New Testament, let's, let's be honest. I mean, mass confession here. We could look at the Ten Commandments and say, I hadn't broken that one. Not that one. Ooh, close to that one. Lied. Ooh, done that. Okay, you know, we start stolen. Yep, did that. But, you know, if you get underneath all of them, with Jesus teaching, when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, you realize, listen, I have broken every one of them. You and I have broken all of the Ten Commandments. So let's don't approach this with a pick and choose or some kind of, you know, rationale that somehow we're holier or better than we are. But think about it this way. Uh, they are pragmatic. You know, I get it. I understand the research because let me ask you, where would you rather live? In a community where people obey the Ten Commandments, right? They don't steal your stuff. They don't come after your wife or, you know, or your, 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 they don't covet your stuff. They don't lie to you. The, the kids, how about this? Kids in your neighborhood, all the kids obey their parents perfectly. That'd be legit. No, you're like, in my own home, that would be amazing. Um, but but you, you want to live there or you want to live in a community where none of those rules are followed? People kill each other. They steal their stuff. Kids don't obey their parents. Uh, they, you know, adultery is taking place all over the place. Where do you want to live, right? See, the Ten Commandments are given so that we might flourish as humans. But if we stop at the moral pragmatism of the commandments, we miss the point altogether. And this is where the research or those who respond to the re- miss the point. If you don't follow the God, give your life to the God who gave the Ten Commandments, you've missed them altogether. So here's the first thing I want, to, I want you to see. The Ten Commandments were given to help us have a deep and growing relationship with God. Everybody say relationship. Relationship. Okay, that's the key word. We think of the, we think of the laws as you know, legalistic. We're no longer under the law. We're under grace. This is true. Uh, so what is the deal? Behind every commandment is a principle. And today the principle is the principle of priority. Okay? The principle of worship. I could say. And here's the simple point of the message today of, I think, the first commandment. There's only one first. You say, of course. Okay, there's only one first. And whatever is first in your life will determine and dictate everything else. All right? And so we find the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, but to place this in context, long before the Mosaic Covenant that we see here, and in Deuteronomy, the law is laid out. So there's not just Ten Commandments, sets up all the law. And, and, and we don't, so long before the Mosaic Covenant was the Abrahamic Covenant. This is worth noting. Long before uh, the commandments were given, God had already established the Israelites as his people. Let me ask you, why did he choose the Israelites? You ever thought about that? Why did they choose, why did he choose them? In Deuteronomy 7, okay, we'll get to Exodus 20 in a sec. It says this. For you are a people holy to the Lord, your God. Lord, by the way, Yahweh. The Lord, your God, has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you. Look at that, set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your father. Watch this. The principle still applies to us. Why does he love us? Because he loves us. Why has he chosen us? Because he chose us. This is, listen, this is one-way love. God chose us because he chose us. He loves us because he loves us. We bring nothing to the table in regard to our salvation, except the sin that makes it necessary. That's all we bring. And it's the same, same is true here. That's what he's saying. 
I chose you because I chose you. I love you because I love you. And this is so important to understand. And then in the first part of the, as he gives the Ten Commandments, watch this. This is how it begins. Verse 1. And God spoke all these things, all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then watch this, almost parenthetically, more explicitly, out of the house of of slavery. This is very important. Look at this. God didn't give the Ten Commandments to the people while they're in Egypt. You know the redemptive story, right? He rescues them. Now watch this. He doesn't say, hey, uh, obey these Ten Commandments, and if you do, I just might pull you out from under Pharaoh. No, no, no. He pulls them out. He rescues them from slavery, right? He draws them out. Moses, the great deliverer, calls them out. They go through the Red Sea, the great salvific moment of the people. And it was an act of faith because they're entering into, look, they got water on both sides. They're walking through as an act of faith they're going through. They end up on the other side, delivered from their enemies who are, who are wiped out in the, ocean, in the, in the, in the Red Sea. They're, they're drowned, all of, them, all of them dead. They find themselves on the other side. Then God says, Bam, you're my people. I rescued you. Now, let me teach you how to live in relationship with me. And let's start from the top 10. Let's go with the basics. Friends, this is our story. The greater deliverer, Jesus, has rescued us from our sin, out of slavery to sin, ultimately leading to our death. He pulls us to the other side into his family, and he says, now, I want you to live for me. This is why we always say it, that, you know, the gospel indicatives precede the gospel imperatives. Indicatives are facts, truths about who you are. The gos- this, is what, this is what Paul does throughout all of his epistles. The first half, first couple of, of chapters are always, look, this is what God's done. This is who you are. You've been rescued. You were once slaves. Now you're people of God. He loves you because he loves you. You bring nothing to the table. Now you have been saved, brought through the Red Sea, as it were, saved out of sin and death over to the other side. Now, here's how you to live. Then come the gospel imperatives. The order is critical. Because if we think we can follow his commands without understanding relationship and without without responding to what he's done for us, then we miss the point altogether and Christianity becomes a religion that bears the name of Jesus Christ, but it's not the gospel. And many people live their lives this way. This is why we talk about this rescuing one another from a cultural Christianity. Without relationship, I can say it this way, only the gospel, only your rescue, Your response to him in worship gives God-honoring animation to your obedience to him. Otherwise, you're obeying him for some other reason, and you will never do it because you're not motivated from a heart of love, and you're not empowered by the Spirit of God. This is why Paul says in Romans 6, But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves, look at his language here. It's the same language. You who were once slaves have become obedient from the heart. Notice that phrase. From the heart, okay, not just following a set of rules, to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. What is the standard of teaching? This is a new way of Jesus. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Now he's saying you're no longer slaves to fear. You're no longer slaves to to the law, to sin, you're now a slave to righteousness. You can live differently now. You and I can live with power over sin because the Holy Spirit resides in us so that we may live lives of righteousness. It's why in Galatians, Paul says that the law, you you ask the question, are we under the law or under grace? Well, we're under grace. We're no longer under the law. Now, I can say this. If you've never received Christ and his forgiveness, his grace, the substitute that he was, he lived the law perfectly on your behalf. If you've never received Christ, having died on the cross for your sin and and, and given you freedom now, forgiven you of all of your failures, of failing all of the law, of every sin that you commit today, every sin you'll commit tomorrow, he's forgiven you completely so you can have a relationship with the Holy God. If you've not done that, you are under the law. You're still under the law and condemnation and ultimately damnation because there is no way to get across this gap. So in Galatians, Paul says the law 
has been given to us as a pedagogos. It's a Greek word that's hard to translate. It's a child conductor. It's a tutor so that you will know that you need a Savior. It's like a mirror. It's like looking in a mirror and you look and say, wow, the mirror reveals that you're having a bad hair day, right? Uh, or bad hair life. I mean, you're just looking at it. You're like, man. But nobody in here has ever taken the mirror off the wall and said, man, let me fix this thing. My hair is all out of whack. Nobody's ever done that because the mirror is not designed to fix the problem. It's designed to reveal the problem. The law is given. Even the commands of God, we say, wow, he is holy. There's no way that anybody can follow what he has set out before it, before us. So we think, well, is the law all about legalism or is it about law and grace? Let me ask you this, even from the start. I would say that the commandments are given out of relationship, out of love, and they're given as an act of grace. You see that now? He's rescued them from, their, from, from slavery. He's rescued us from sin. If he's done all of this, he can, he can tell us to do anything he wants to do. And we need to adjust our lives to him, not the other way around. And that's the problem for many of us. We think, man, your commands are hard. I don't fully understand. I'm looking through the fog. I see a light, but I can't quite see it. I don't understand that commandment. I don't get it. Listen, friends, if you understand what he's done for you, you don't. it doesn't matter whether you understand it or not. He's given it to you as a heart of love. And, and so God gives us his commands. Let me ask you, is it, is it loving or is it legalistic for you to tell your children not to go play out in the street? I mean, that's, that's an act of love. Right. That's not legalism and demands that are not coming from a heart of love. So I just want you to see this because some of us need, need, need to hear this. God's commands are always loving. Every one of his commands are loved are, are loving. And I want to teach you how to respond as we set up this this uh, series. How do you respond to the negative commands of God? Meaning thou shalt not. OK, there's a lot of thou shalt nots here. Not all of them, but, but in the Ten Commandments. And we see these thou shalt nots, and we think God's this cosmic killjoy who doesn't want us to have any fun. But I want you to see this. This is key. There's a precept, and then there's a principle, and, and then there is a person. So, so a, a precept is a command or a rule, right? And we're going to catch a principle behind each one, but behind every one of them is a loving person, God himself. I could say it this way. Behind every, uh, every precept is a principle. Behind every principle is a person, God himself who is loving and kind. His intentions are for us to flourish and to experience life as it's meant to live. And I want to share with, share with you something that was a game changer for me many years ago, okay? And it's this. Behind every negative command are two positive reasons, all right? Think about it. One is to protect us, okay, protection. The second is provision. God gives every thou shalt not, don't do that. Parents, this is a good word for your kids. You, you can do this with every command. Every commandment is given to protect us from something and to provide something better. It's a good way to parent your kids. Don't do that. Why not? All right, here we go. Protect, watch this. Uh, don't murder. That's, this is an easy one. Uh, two positive reasons. Protect us from what? Not being murdered. That is good. Um, not living in fear. Not living in a society where people... Imagine if in America we just, we obeyed that one. That one. Don't murder. We wouldn't live in fear. We wouldn't have all the debate of gun control and whatever else. We, we, we wouldn't be living in fear. And what's this? To protect us and to provide something better. What's that? Life without fear. How about life? Right? Not murdering each other. You can do this with every command. Think about it. We're going to get to um, don't commit adultery. We're going to broaden that on that day. We're going to talk about uh, sexual purity. Don't have sex outside of marriage. It's God's command. Oh, that's a hard command. I don't like that command. Why is he giving us that command? Protect us and provide for us. Protect us from what? Well, emotional shame, guilt. Fear even, uh, STDs. I mean, let's just a long list of things he's protecting us from. But wait, wait, wait. It doesn't stop there. Provide something better. What's that? Uh, Jesus is better. Jesus is better. You, you can live life 
and, and pursue him, pursue him and say, you know, the Lord, he is enough for me. I find all of my superior satisfactions in him. Or how about this? In marriage, sex between two people in a covenantal, lifelong relationship with one another. Better. By every measurement. Protect us and provide for us. So listen, that is such, I'm telling you, this is great teaching. I'm kind of hyped about this. But for you to apply to your kids and help, help us all understand. So then we get to the third command. I mean, the first commandment in verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. They've just come out of Egypt uh, for 430 years. Uh, a culture of, poly, uh, of, of yeah, polygamy, of, of, of polytheism, where they believe in multiple gods. 29 major gods. And 2,000 lesser gods, he says, there's one God, and it's me. Now, this is not totally new, but he, he, he offers this. So here's the whole thing, verses 1 through 3. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. God demands his rightful place. Friends, if you don't get this one right, your whole life is out of whack. It's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. He's saying whatever you value most, whatever's first, is going to guide the rest of your life. And if you have a misplaced priority, it leads to a mistaken identity, which then leads to misguided activities that leads to a life that is completely off track. You see how important this is? There's only one first. If everything is first, then nothing is first in your life. And you say, well, how do I apply this? Let's land this. How do I obey this command? How do I know if God is first in my life? I've told you before, your deepest emotions will tell you, will point you to your gods. What kept you up last night? What were you thinking about? What do you worry about? Point you to your idol. What makes you anxious? Point you to your God. See, we make good things best things. We make good things God things often, often good things. And we, we run after those things and they guide our lives. They have become our functional gods. And God says, there is no other God, but you're going to pursue as if other gods before me. You look at your deepest emotions. What makes you really happy? What makes you really sad? What make, how about the thought of losing something makes you very anxious and worried that points you to your idols? Friends, that is worth thinking about. Jesus was after this principle in Matthew 6, when he said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Now, I'll close with this. Kind of like bookends. We started here at the first part. Now, we're going to go through all the commands throughout the summer. But I want you to look and see what happens after the commandments are given. And then we're going to pray and head out into the day Worshiping God with obedience. Look at what, look at verse 18. You see it on the screen. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, wow, this is a holy moment. This is big. The people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, This is almost comical, like our, our bumper video. Um, you speak to us, and we will listen, but uh, do not let God speak to us lest we die. I mean, they're scared to death, understandably. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to you. He's revealing his power and how awesome he is to test you, that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. He's revealing himself to you so that you'll obey these commands. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And I want you to see this. Moses drew near. The people stood far off. Let me ask you, are you drawing near to God? See, this is how we apply it. Is God truly first in your life? Well, Jeff, how can he be first in my life? Okay, watch this. Many people in churches today could happen here. I sure hope, man, I want to hear from the pastor. I want to hear from somebody who's been close to God. That would be, be really, and it's helpful. That's helpful. And for the folks who have faith that you may not have, understanding that you don't have, that's, that's important. But many people, I want to hear, okay, I hope the pastor has been with God when you haven't opened the Word of God all week long. 
Man, I like coming to church. We're praying, somebody's leading, and, and all that is good and should be a priority. We'll see that too, right? That we would obey the Sabbath, that we would worship together every Sunday. But let me ask you, are you spending time with Him and His Word? Not first. Are you seeking to draw near to Him every single day? Are you spending time with Him in prayer? Not first. Do you find yourself in a connect group? Are you committed to a people who are seeking His faith? Listen, these commandments are given not in isolation. They're given in community. They're given for a people to obey together because we need each other. And so today, friends, listen, if you have never received Christ, I hope you've heard this. He's come to rescue you. That's the first step. This is not a legalistic, you know, law-driven, guilt-ridden religion. This is a response to a God who says, I love you. I love you because I love you because I love you. And he says, now come. Let me show you how to live, how to flourish. I just want us to pray together. Would you just close your eyes and bow your heads as we close our time? This is the most important moment. Moses stepped into the fog. He stepped into the smoke, into the, he wanted a relationship with God. The people didn't. Do you? Right now, you may need to step into the fog of your doubt and fear. You need to find a superior satisfaction in Christ. Because your life is out of order. It's love out of order. You need to find and discover the explosive power of a new affection that's found in Christ alone. Step through the fog and you will see the light. By faith, receive his grace right now. Say, Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I give you my life in response. And for all of us who are here, maybe you have prayed that prayer, you've received Christ. I want to challenge you. Are you, are you a member of the church? Are you devoted to Christ? To say, I can follow God and not be a part of the church is to say, I can follow some of what Jesus said, but not all of what he said. Not all of what he wants. Friend, obey him today. Let this be your day. Lord, we give our lives to you. I pray for every person here, myself included, as we walk into this day and throughout the week to come, that you would be first in our lives, above all else. That we point people to the one who's rescued us. That we'd respond with lives of righteousness as we live out of obedience to your loving commands. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. And amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.